A critical part of the design of any clinical research investigation is to determine the number of subjects or sample size required to detect a statistically significant effect of the treatment or phenomenon under study. We have touched on different elements relevant to the calculation of sample size, but haven't brought these pieces together to see how they relate to this important topic. Let's start with a case illustration from an earlier module in the course. This was a randomized controlled trial published in Fertility and Sterility in August of 2010 that examined the impact on pregnancy rates of GnRH agonist administration at the time of implantation in intrauterine insemination cycles. The sample consisted of 344 women undergoing intrauterine insemination. The primary outcome of the trial was pregnancy rate defined as a positive beta-HCG result after an IUI cycle. The results of the study showed that the pregnancy rate per randomized patient was similar in both groups of the study, being 22.7% in the intervention group compared to 22.1% in the placebo group. A standard part of the planning of virtually any randomized control trial is the calculation of needed sample size to determine a statistically significant effect for the primary outcome of interest. It is also generally required that this a priori calculation be reported in the primary manuscript reporting the results of the randomized trial. There are several key components to determining sample size that we will discuss in this section. Quoting from the Materials and Methods section of the manuscript, the sample size was calculated to detect a difference in pregnancy rate of 20 to 30 percent. Assuming a significance level of 0.05 and a statistical power of 80 percent, it was calculated that 294 patients were needed in each group to detect this increase. Expecting a 15 to 20 percent loss, 50 patients more per group were considered to be randomized. Therefore, 344 patients were finally planned to be included in each group. The important values to focus on here are the clinically relevant difference equal to 20 to 30 percent, significance level equal to 0.05, power equal to 80 percent, and sample size of 344 per group, which includes expected attrition. Because this trial follows subjects over time, it is appropriate to consider the impact of subject attrition and incorporate this into the formal sample size calculation. For now, we are just interested in looking at the individual elements that go into a sample size calculation. We will also focus most of our discussion on the context of a randomized trial with two treatment groups. In the StatCrunch demonstration, we will look more closely at how these individual components are combined to arrive at an estimated sample size. Let's quickly review the meaning of some of these quantities in order to better understand this sample size statement. Alpha is the probability of making a type 1 error, which is rejecting H0 when H0 is true. Beta is the probability of making a type 2 error, which is to fail to reject H0 when H0 is false. The power of the test is the probability of rejecting H0 when it is not true, which is exactly what you want to do. And power is equal to 1 minus beta. For fixed sample size, there is a trade-off between the alpha and beta error rates. If you decrease the alpha error rate so that you make fewer type 1 errors, this will cause the beta error rate to increase, resulting in more type 2 errors. This increases the importance of considering which of the two errors are more serious to commit. If you want to ensure that both the alpha and beta error rates remain low, then you need to increase the overall sample size of the study. In practice, most randomized trials use values of 0.05 for alpha and 0.2 for beta. Recall that power is 1 minus beta, here equal to 0.8 or 80 percent. Use of these values suggests the following. Provided there is a difference of the magnitude expected between treatment arms, there is an 80 percent chance that a test of hypothesis will yield a statistically significant result. Of course, this means that there is a 20 percent chance that a test of hypothesis will fail to attain statistical significance with the difference of the magnitude expected between treatment arms. The alpha or type 1 error rate means that if there is no difference between treatment arms, 
there is only a 5% chance that a test of hypothesis will yield an erroneously statistically significant result. Note that when a trial is described as being underpowered, this is a reference to the type 2 error being too large, with the concern being that there is an important difference between the treatment arms that is not identified by a test of hypothesis as being statistically significant. There are three general approaches to determining sample size. The first is to simply just collect and analyze some data. This is clearly not a principled approach and not a good idea. The second approach is what we are referring to as the conventional approach. Here we calculate a fixed sample size prior to the initiation of the study. We collect data from that many subjects and then analyze the data as described in the protocol. This is by far the most commonly used approach in clinical research today. Note that the conventional approach can also include protocol specified interim analyses that may terminate a study early possibly before all planned subjects have been enrolled. For example, although we didn't mention this in our discussion of the sample size for our case illustration, the protocol did specify an interim analysis to be performed after half of the proposed sample was completed. In fact, on completion of the protocol specified interim analysis, the study was stopped. In general, the inclusion of interim analyses in the conventional approach is complicated and requires special consideration and input from a statistician. A third approach involves using a dynamic sample size that is flexible and adaptive based on interim analyses of the data conducted during sample accrual. Although this approach is gaining more acceptance for use in clinical trials, the sample size methods and analytic methods for these designs are not straightforward. The rest of this section will focus on issues related to the conventional approach. We have stressed the use of confidence intervals in combination with p-values in this course. The sample size calculation can be focused on confidence intervals or hypothesis testing depending on which is of primary interest, precision of the parameters associated with the primary outcome or statistical significance of a hypothesis test of the primary outcome. Particularly for randomized trials, the hypothesis testing approach is most commonly used. As stated earlier, the sample size calculation is based on the primary outcome and statistical method used to analyze that outcome. Common situations for a two-group randomized trial include two proportions or a difference between means. For our case illustration, the primary outcome is pregnancy rate, a dichotomous outcome that will be summarized in each group by a proportion. Therefore, the test of interest is a comparison of two independent proportions. Given a specific outcome and analytic method, calculation of needed sample size requires specification of several quantities. The significance level or alpha level of the primary hypothesis test, the power or type 2 error rate of the primary hypothesis test, the relevant desired treatment difference expected to be observed between the treatment arms. This should reflect the smallest clinically meaningful difference between the groups that can reasonably be expected based on the potency of the intervention under study. This value should be selected based on clinical expertise and previous research in the field. Selecting too large an effect size will result in a smaller calculated sample size but can result in an underpowered study if the intervention is unable to deliver the specified treatment effect. Lastly, and importantly, an estimate of the variability in the outcome under study is also required. This value should be based on pilot data or based on estimates published in the literature in similar populations to those proposed for the study. Note that the term effect size is often used in relation to sample size. Formally, the effect size is the ratio of the treatment difference to the variability of the outcome. The larger the effect size, the smaller the sample size. Up until now, we have been focusing our discussion on the statistical aspects of calculating sample size. However, in actuality, things are more complicated than that. There are a number of important logistical issues that must also be considered and addressed. These include available budget for the study and cost per patient, 
ability to recruit from the target population and related recruitment issues, allowable accrual period for recruiting patients, anticipated refusal rates, and for longitudinal studies, anticipated dropout rate. All of these factors need to be considered and incorporated into the final determination of the required sample size. Some concluding comments. The need to address both statistical and logistical factors really changes the process of determining sample size from a simple calculation to an in-depth, complex negotiation between the statistician and the PI of the study. Generally speaking, the more substantive the interaction, the more accurate the final calculation will be. Although alpha and beta are traditionally set at 0.05 and 0.2 respectively, restricting beta to a smaller value allows for a more definitive conclusion when the test of the primary hypothesis fails to reject the null hypothesis. Restricting both alpha and beta to 0.05, for example, reduces the concern that the study was underpowered and failed to detect a meaningful difference when there actually was one, allowing the investigator to make a stronger claim in the event of a non-significant result that the intervention was indeed ineffective. When the study designs become more complicated or the data requires non-parametric tests, the calculation of sample size also becomes complicated and the expertise of a statistician is critical to obtain accurate sample size estimates. Getting good estimates is critical to the accuracy of sample size calculations and is generally the responsibility of the clinician to obtain for the statistician. As mentioned, pilot data from samples with similar characteristics to those of the proposed study or estimates from previous literature in the same area and population are the best sources for this information. The old saying, garbage in, garbage out, is definitely true when it comes to sample size calculations. We have focused our discussion on the calculation of sample size. One can also look at this from the perspective of statistical power. Given a specified sample size, one can determine the power to detect a specified difference between groups. It is common in randomized trials to calculate the sample size needed for the primary hypothesis and then determine the available power for secondary hypotheses given that fixed sample size. There are a multitude of software programs available for calculating sample size, ranging from free web-based calculators to dedicated sample size programs that cost in excess of $1,000 per license. For complicated designs, such dedicated software programs can be invaluable. However, for many standard designs, typical web-based calculators like the ones we will demonstrate in the next section are perfectly sufficient and acceptable. Because there are usually a variety of calculation formulas for any particular sample size situation, it is generally advisable to include information about software used for the calculation when giving a report of the estimated sample size for a study. That's all for now.